Hi, I'm Lucy Bose. Um, I'm an associate professor here in psychology for those of you who don't know me. And my research has been primarily focused on bullying, the bullying in childhood and the association between bullying and mental health. But today I wanted to do a very quick presentation looking at bullying and harassment in academia. So what do we mean by bullying and harassment? Well, the definition of harassment is the broader definition. Um, and we say that um, someone is harassing someone um, if they're engaging in unwanted and unwarranted conduct, which has the purpose or the effect of violating other person's dignity or creating an intimidating, hostile, degrading, humiliating, or offensive environment for another person. And the recipient doesn't need to have explicitly stated that the behavior was unwanted. So the person who's experiencing this doesn't have to necessarily explicitly state that. Bullying is actually a subset of harassment, um, and it's characterized by offensive, intimidating, malicious or insulting behavior, or the misuse of power through means intended to undermine, humiliate, denigrate, or injure the recipient. So what, what do we really mean then if we're talking about bullying and harassment? What does it look like in more of an academic setting? Um, it could mean things like sustained hostile behavior, and that could include, but not be limited to things like ridiculing or threatening, blaming others for things, invasion of privacy, putting someone down. And the definition would also include interference with matriculation um, for students, but also with career progression um, in different ways. That could involve, for example, removing funding or writing falsely negative recommendation letters. Um, it could also mean taking credit for others' work, um, removing people off authorships, for example, on academic papers, or claiming that um, their work was done by another person. Um, it could also lead to things like threatening to cancel visas or fellowships. So as you can see, these can be really um, incredibly negative behaviours that will have a, a direct and detrimental effect on a person's career, and also, most importantly, on their well-being. Unfortunately, education apparently um, in, has the sort of dubious claim of being the worst workplace setting for bullying and harassment. And these types of experiences can lead to quite long lasting and serious mental health implications. So why does bullying happen? Bullying at its essence um, is thought to be a misuse of power. It's all about sort of attaining power or maintaining power. And you typically get more bullying in more hierarchical settings. So academia, of course, can be very hierarchical. And perhaps it's no surprise then that we see particularly high rates of bullying and harassment in this particular setting. And what might that look like? What types of hierarchy are we talking about here? Well, it could be, for example, you know, very well-respected um, figures who have a particular amount of authority in their field or for their position. And they are an individual, therefore, who has power over quite a large amount of people. That in itself, not necessarily a bad thing. It's only when that power may be misused um, and directed um, to cause harm that we see things like bullying and harassment. You also, um, it, it may not just be an individual in hierarchical settings, for example, where you have, I don't know, um, someone at the very top, um, a head of department, a dean in a college, for example, and then you have people who work for them and they may also manage teams. And so bullying and harassment could occur in any one of those contexts, but it often takes place in the context of a power differential. And that means that the person who is experiencing the bullying um, finds it difficult to defend him or herself. And it's thought that the impact of the experience might be particularly detrimental because they may feel more powerless um, to help. Um, the idea on the right here with a sort of networked um, power map, I thought was a nice one. And I'll, I'll refer back to that in the end when we're thinking about changing culture. But I wanted to focus a little bit on this power. Um, and it could be, you know, this could be power from a PI um, and the way they manage a lab that could be either, um, it could be behaviors that may be interpreted as being negative. Um, it could also mean power in terms of a number of people um, ganging up, excluding someone. And that doesn't necessarily mean in person. That could also be online. Um, that could be leaving people out of an email chain repeatedly and on purpose, for example. 
And I think it's important to highlight here that these kinds of um, power differentials aren't always as obvious as the slide might make out. And people can um, forget um, that there is a power differential. And so, you know, someone might be intending to banter or um, to make jokes and may not be aware of the fact that if they're in a position of power, it may not be experienced as banter or joke from someone in, um, in, in a different position um, in the power hierarchy. So sometimes um, there could be unintentional consequences of being in a kind of hierarchical structure such as that. Other times um, it may be things like overwhelm and stress that leads people in a position of power to perhaps um, forget that some of their actions um, may again be experienced differently from people than perhaps was intended. I highlight that because although um, bullying by definition would be intentional acts of harm, I actually think a lot, um, a lot of sort of negativity that can happen in the workplace um, is often unintentional and is often the result of things like existing power structures and not necessarily appreciating the impact. Finally, it's also possible um, for bullying and harassment to come in the other direction. Um, although it's primarily um, from someone who is more powerful to those who are less powerful, you can get situations, for example, where students have been known to um, pick on, tease, leave out, gossip about um, a PI or a boss or someone in a position of power as well. So it can go the other way. Um, but in that particular context, you would, um, it's usually the case it would be a number of individuals, and then that power hierarchy um, is a little bit less clear. So that's all about power structures and hierarchy. Um, but bullying really is a problem in academia. And I was quite kind of shocked by these figures. So in any 12 month period, on average, 25% of faculty members self identified as being bullied while nearly half said that they'd witnessed others being bullied according to a review that was published in 2019. So that's in some academic research. Um, of course, um, you know, there, there may be difficulties in measurement. Um, it depends on how you survey these things, but these are really quite high rates. Um, Nature did a PhD survey back in 2019, and they found that one in five of the graduate students who responded reported that they had experienced bullying. And of those who had experienced bullying, over half reported feeling unable to discuss their situation without fear of personal repercussions. So that's a, you know, you can understand therefore why people who are experiencing these kinds of harassment may feel powerless and how it's likely to impact um, on their well-being. Here's an example, just so we can get a sense of what we're talking about here. This is something I've taken from an interesting website. This wasn't from a student in Oxford. Um, but nevertheless, I think it's really important to get a sense of, of how this may be experienced. So a PhD student witnessed his advisor's extreme response to a fellow graduate student. Two years later, he himself was the focus of the supervisor's ire. The abuse was always for little mistakes. For example, submitting a paper to a journal with a typo, he says. It was always disproportionate, including yelling, ostracization and threats, such as removing his name from the authorship of a paper or discontinuing supervision. So here we have quite clear examples of an abuse of power, of, of negative and intentional harm. Um, but it's not necessarily always so clear cut. And particularly, I think academia is an interesting context because in academia, we do, you know, part of part of academia is about discussing each other's work, for example, and that absolutely can involve academic criticism. Um, it can involve, um, you know, going through people's work and, and uh, critiquing the methods, the writing, um, and, and that is part of freedom of speech, um, and particularly part of academic freedom that we really value in university cultures. And indeed, freedom of speech and academic freedom are both protected by law. Um, but the rights must be exercised within the law. And so academic debate um, is not harassment um, if it's conducted respectfully and if it's conducted in such a way that it doesn't violate the dignity of others or create an intimidating, hostile, degrading, humiliating or an offensive environment to them. So it's OK to have a debate. It's OK to be critical, but we need to do so respectfully. Within the Oxford context, um, you may have noticed if you've used the loo um, that we have some procedures, harassment procedures um, that we put up so that people know what the um, what routes they can follow if they're experiencing different forms of harassment and bullying. 
So for example, here we have a harassment um, flowchart for students. So there's a flowchart for students and there's a separate one for staff because the routes um, to access support are slightly different. Um, but both of these um, harassment flowcharts um, advise people to speak up and to speak to others, for example. Um, and that could be um, that could be the person who is harassing them. So if you feel actually able and in a position to have a conversation with someone, and this may be particularly the case if you feel that they may be um, doing something that's perhaps unintentional, um, and if you feel that actually it would be very helpful to have that conversation, then that's certainly a first point, point of call. But for lots of forms of bullying in particular, where there is a power differential, um, it may perhaps be unlikely that someone does feel comfortable in doing that. And so then both of these flow charts um, would encourage you to speak to someone else. So for example, in our department, you might choose to speak to a harassment advisor. I am one of the harassment advisors, um, but you'll see on the posters in blue um, and um, on our department website, some of the other harassment advisors as well. So you can always speak to us for some more informal support um, and to talk about what you're experiencing. You don't have to come to us, please do speak to someone that you feel comfortable talking with. That could be, for example, your supervisor or your manager. Um, it could be um, HR or personnel um, in the department. So initially this is about sort of talking it through with people. Um, it may escalate though, of course. So if it gets to the point where you've spoken with people, the situation isn't changing, um, you could have a, a mediated discussion, for example, so that may involve talking to the head of department, so talking to Kia, um, or talking to the direct line manager of the person and having a mediated um, discussion with them, or indeed explaining to them what you are experiencing, um, and they will take it from there. If, however, this is a serious case, or and or um, if that isn't appropriate, or if that hasn't resolved the issue, you may also make a formal complaint. And all of this information is available both on the harassment flowchart and also on the university's harassment web pages. So I do encourage you to have a look at those. But a sort of brief summary or some tips, um, if you yourself are experiencing bullying or harassment in the workplace, I think a really key thing is to find your support group. So people who are bullied um, often feel excluded, they feel isolated. It can really negatively impact your mood and your well-being. Um, it can leave you feeling very vulnerable and less likely to seek support from others. But you need to find your people. You need to find your allies, people who you feel good to be around, people who you can talk to about the situation, who will provide support to you straight away and directly. So I would strongly encourage that. Um, talk it through with people. As I mentioned, um, that might be through your harassment advisor. That could be through your PI. Um, and that may also involve the head of department. It may be appropriate to keep a log of the behaviours. So if you do think that this may um, lead towards a formal complaint, it can be very helpful for you. If you have, for example, stored emails where there's been um, examples of harassment occurring, um, as you may be able to provide these as evidence of what happened, or even a log of time and um, situation and context, so that when you do come to talk about this, you can give clear examples, because obviously these things do really affect us and they affect um, our emotions, so it can be quite difficult to then recall them when you are speaking with someone about what you've gone through. So having a log would be really helpful um, in guiding that discussion. And again, finally, you can make a formal complaint. Um, so if this situation is not changing and if it's, um, you know, don't, let, don't sit silently and, and feel that you have to go through this alone. Um, there are you know, ways in which we can support you. Um, that's all about if you yourself are experiencing bullying or, or harassment. But one thing I really wanted to highlight in my last couple of minutes is that bullying really is everybody's problem. It's not just the person who's experiencing it or just the perpetrator. Um, we really need to encourage what we would call active bystander behaviour. Um, and here we refer to social psychology. There's been lots of really interesting research showing that bullying often happens with an audience. Um, and actually, if the audience or the people who are aware of the bullying stay silent, the impact on the person who's experiencing the bullying is even more detrimental. They feel that it, you know, there is this audience effect and there's this implicit um, 
understanding that perhaps the audience is condoning what's happening or the other people present are condoning the bullying. So we want to promote um, active bystander engagement. And the university has a poster quite helpfully. Um, and it's got some cool videos on its website that you could have a look at um, that talks about responsible bystander behavior. So it varies from things like um, you may have sort of direct um, action during the bullying. So if you see or hear bullying happening, and if you are in a position where you feel able to point that out, we should all be doing so. Um, bullying happens in a hierarchy, so it's even more important that this happens from the top down and that we see that by people who are in positions of power, but all of us have a role to play in calling out situations that are negative. And there are some really nice videos and how you can do that in a way that is still respectful, that's non-confrontational, but makes it really clear that that behavior is not acceptable. Um, another D is distract. Um, so if there's an, a situation that seems um, particularly uh, heightened, um, the motions are heighting, heightened, it may be that you can step in and distract away from the situation um, by, for example, asking about a meeting for the next week, um, something to diffuse it in the moment so that you can then provide support um, to the person who's at the receiving end and also help to kind of diffuse um, a particularly challenging situation. We also um, encourage others to delegate. So, you know, it's difficult to step up on your own, but if there's a group of you, you might encourage each other. So if one person says something and it, or if you're with someone and someone speaks out, chime in, speak up with them um, to show your support for what they're saying as well. And the more people that do this, the easier it becomes. You, you create a culture in which people feel empowered to step up and to highlight things like this. And finally, um, it's often the case that we might freeze in the moment. I think everyone's experienced that where it didn't feel right at the time to say anything or you don't know what to say or how to act. And um, But the point of delay, the fourth D, is that it's never too late to act. Um, it may be that later you feel able to approach both parties um, and to say what you observed and why you feel uncomfortable about it. Um, it might be that you could advise the receiver that there are people that they can talk to, for example, departmental administrator, head of department, harassment advisor, and so on. Um, and remember that if you do that, if you are able to provide empathy and support for the people who've experienced this or challenge the behaviors of others, it can lead to behavior change. It can normalize responsible bystander behavior and promote a much healthier culture. I hope you found that useful um, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.